Welcome back, folks. And now it is my privilege to welcome our first presenter of the day, Kathy Riley. Kathy is a graduate of a, the Master of Science in Narrative Medicine program in the Keck School of Medicine at USC. She holds a certification of professional achievement in narrative medicine from Columbia University and is a facilitator for Columbia's narrative medicine virtual group sessions. Riley is Associate Director of Programs at the Cancer Support Community Los Angeles. Her areas of interest include the role narrative medicine plays in the nature and quality of healthcare delivered to patients and families and its role in alleviating distress for healthcare providers. Riley brings her expertise in narrative medicine and public health to her work in cancer survivorship, program planning, and family-centered care. She is the mother of Peter, a long-term pediatric brain tumor survivor. Please welcome Kathy. Myra, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and what an incredible privilege to be here with all of you this morning. I am so excited to talk to you uh, about narrative medicine's role in enhancing the patient voice. And we can go ahead and share the slide deck and get started. Wonderful. So not only do we want to address narrative medicine's role in enhancing the patient voice, I also wanna talk about the tangible ways that I see applying narrative medicine to your practice. And in addition to applying it to your practice, I want us to take a look at applying it to self-care. I'm also going to invite you uh, partway through the talk to experience a small part of a narrative medicine workshop. We'll do some looking, some listening, and some writing together. So find something that you can write on, whether that's pen and paper, your computer, your phone, but, but get prepared to join us and do a little bit of writing. And then on a personal note, and, and you heard this in my introduction, I was drawn to the field of narrative medicine as part of my journey to make sense of what happened to my family when my son Peter was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Every day, our family experiences the sweet and the bitter of Peter's complex survival. I discovered that through the practice of narrative medicine, we encounter stories of loss, and longing for restoration in poetry, in fiction, and in art and music. And I began to wonder if engaging in the close reading and discussion of those texts with others, and then writing about that engagement might connect me more deeply to my story, to the story of other providers that I work with and to the narratives of patients and their families. And I think that it might do the same for you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So here are our objectives uh, for the presentation. I'll describe narrative medicine, its movements and methods, demonstrate knowledge of how narrative medicine principles are utilized in clinical practice, apply narrative medicine methods and clinical practice to address issues of disparity in healthcare access or resources that affect disease progression and outcome. And my hope is that today's presentation will provide you with additional tools to aid you in your work with patient families, in your communication with other team members and in navigating your own journeys. I think that we could say that narrative medicine assumes we all have stories and it places a high value on those stories. Next slide. Recently, I conducted a series of narrative medicine workshops with pediatric, with a pediatric neuro-oncology team. And a team member said, 
everyone wants to know why this happened to their child, but we can't always know the meaning. We were engaged in discussion of Mary Oliver's poem in Blackwater Woods, which you see on the slide in front of you. The poem reads in part, every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the Black River of Loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. In the shadow of that poem, a team member remarked that each step of grief is different for each family whose child is diagnosed with a brain tumor, that families process grief at their own pace. Another participant articulated a new idea suggesting that through loss comes life, or at least a new way of looking at things. Another noted that some physicians are better than others at allowing time for this process. And I listened and wondered, what does it mean to be better at this process? To allow time where none exists, how does a physician or other healthcare provider help a family say goodbye to their child? Well, I bear witness that for members of a neuro-oncology team wrestling with narratives like the one you see before you fosters healing dialogue around shared patient and provider experience of pain. So how does this kind of reflection change the way that providers think about patients? See all that they are and hear all that they are saying. So this is where narrative medicine holds promise. Let's go to our next slide. What is narrative medicine? Um, I get this question all the time when I tell people, uh, I have a master of science in narrative medicine and, and, and they turn their head and say, what is that? I've never heard of that. Uh, well, narrative medicine had its genesis with a group of clinicians, scholars, and creative writers at Columbia University in New York who sought to discover new ways to hear their patient stories and to see beyond the illness to the patients themselves. The goal of narrative medicine is to improve healthcare. The vision is to unite all who seek care and all who seek to give care in an environment of safety, of purpose, of vision, and unconditional commitment to the interests of the patients. And I wanna say that one more time, an unconditional commitment to the interests of the patients. So what is it? Narrative medicine is practiced with the narrative skills of recognizing, absorbing, interpreting, and being moved by the stories of illness. And that is a definition uh, from one of the founders of narrative medicine, Rita Sharon, and we'll hear uh, more from her today through my words. Narrative medicine methods harness creativity and insight into helping professionals not just diagnose and treat patients, but to bear witness to what those patients undergo. So what narrative medicine is not, though we often find narrative medicine workshops therapeutic, they are not therapy sessions. Facilitators of narrative medicine workshops do not offer advice, direction, or diagnostic aids of any kind. And then narrative medicine has three movements. And the first movement is attention. It is a state of deep attentive listening to the teller of a story. Rita Sharon uses the phrasing, the state of heightened focus and commitment that a listener can donate to a teller. That's revolutionary for me. A state of heightened focus and commitment that a listener can donate to a teller. Imagine that in coming to this kind of attentive listening. It means I need to empty myself 
of any preconceived notions or ideas so that I can be a pure witness of what is being said. Sharon goes on to say, attention may be the most urgent goal in our work, to attend gravely, silently, absorbing oceanically that which the other says, connotes, displays, performs, and means. The second movement representation is reflecting on what is heard or perceived, usually in writing, so that it is visible to both listener and teller. It's a way to say, this is what I think you told me. And then affiliation is a natural outcome of deep listening and knowledge gained through reflection. It binds patients and clinicians together to stay on course no matter where their journey leads. Sharon refers to this as the interior of the two of us. Let's go on to the next slide. So the great empty cup of attention. When I think about this and about attention, an image from the writing of Henry James that Rita Sharon points us to helps me to understand what's involved. Take a minute as I read this excerpt, really trying to see everything that is in front of you. So crystal, cl so, so crystal clean, the great empty cup of attention that he set between them on the table. His large settled face, though firm, was not as she had thought at first, hard. He looked in the oddest manner to her fancy half like a general and half like a bishop. She had established a relation with it. And the relation was the special trophy that for the hour she bore off. It was like an absolute possession, a new resource altogether, something done up in the softest silk and tucked away under the arm of memory. When we listen with our whole selves, we offer this great empty cup of attention and it becomes a gift. And the gift costs us as the listener because we have to empty ourselves to offer it. Rita Sharon in her article, Attention, Representation and Affiliation draws our attention to this work of James. She writes, do we not feel exhilarated when we can achieve this empty attention, when we can place ourselves at the disposal of the other, let the other talk through us, ventriloquize, find the words in which to say that which cannot be said. She writes that she offers this attention to new patients when she meets them. She says, I'm going to be your doctor. I need to know a lot about your body and your health and your life. Please tell me what you think I should know about your situation. Please tell me what you think I should know about your situation. Can you hear how this approach amplifies the patient voice. Now I'm going to ask you a question and here's where we're going to start writing. I'm gonna ask you to write for one minute. I'll keep an eye on the clock. What do you wish someone knew about your situation? What do you wish someone knew about your situation? Go ahead and write, take one minute, I'll let you know when our time is up.
All right. Let's bring our attention back here to the presentation. You may have experienced in that writing how immediately that question goes deeper than a traditional medical history ever could. Next slide. So using narrative medicine in your clinical practice, uh, we've got um, a few more methods uh, to cover in narrative medicine, but I wanted to stop at this point in the talk because um, I put myself in your shoes and I find myself saying, this is really great, but what do I do with this as, as a clinician? Or uh, uh, perhaps we have members of our cancer support community watching. What does this mean uh, for me? So let's go deeper for a minute and talk about how you can apply what we're doing um, to, to your practice, to your life. Enhancing the patient and family voice. This empty cup of attention helps you see the patient and it helps the patient find their voice. Can you see that? Telling you more about themselves and about their situation. The narrative medicine approach can also help you in other ways, relating to colleagues, attending to self. And it can also help in addressing issues of disparity and healthcare access or resources that affect disease progression and outcome. And you'll see these practical applications now woven throughout the rest um, of the talk. So let's go on to the next slide. I wanna talk for a minute um, about representation. That's that second movement. We've spent a lot of time on attention. This is, this is the second movement, representation. To unlock a new dimension of what is talked about in a group setting or with a patient, the act of writing endows the reflections with form so that others can join the writer in beholding it. This can be accomplished during or after an encounter with a patient. Language helps to convey our experiences to others. And Rita Sharon illustrates by describing an encounter a nurse had with a patient. The nurse said, I knew when I admitted her that I would write about her. I knew when I admitted her that I would write about her suggesting to Sharon that even the promise of future representation in writing alters the attentive present. Sharon goes on to say, this is very radical. I feel bold enough to say that representing these events enables us to experience them. Representing these events in writing enables us to experience them. So let's move on now to the narrative medicine methods. I think you'll also see the movements, attention, representation, and affiliation woven into these methods. So the signature method of narrative medicine is called close reading or slow looking. By closely looking at the details of a text or work of art, we train ourselves to see everything that is in front of us. And we're gonna do that today, I promise. In this way, we come to attention. As participants closely read a poem or a painting in a narrative medicine workshop, we invite them to think of questions like, when does the poem take place? Where are you? Whom do you see? Whom do you hear? How? does this feel? By closely looking at the details of a text or work of art, we train ourselves to see everything that is in front of us. And I wonder, and this is important, I wonder if we train ourselves to see the beauty, the pain, the complexity, 
the ambiguity in a work of art, we might begin to see our patients as works of art in all their brokenness and beauty. And then prompted writing and responses. In narrative medicine, we say that we write in the shadow of the text. This is the representation. And we do it by writing to a prompt. The writing prompt relates to this discussion of the text and invites readers to articulate their individual relationship to the text. Rita Sharon tells us that prompts ask readers to look inward to find resonance with the text's ambitions and allow them to commingle with their own memories and experiences. After writing, we ask for volunteers to read their prompted writing and we respond to these writings as texts, attending to the craft and the language of them, not probing the writer for additional information. And then finally, humility and an open mind. Narrative medicine workshops create spaces of discovery. No one is an expert. And I think that is so important. They really are spaces of discovery. We examine text together as a community of readers and listeners and learners. And then these methods and movements come together then to grow our narrative competence. And let's go to the next slide and, and look at what that, what, what does that mean? What is narrative competence? It's the ability to acknowledge, to absorb, to interpret, and to act on the stories and the plights of others. As your narrative competence grows, you recognize the power of voice. Recognizing the person who's telling the story. Who are they? What's their story? What's their language? If we define communication as the communication as the creation of shared meaning, we have to take into account the other person in the exchange. We can learn this through reading a poem. What does the poem reveal about the poet? What's the attitude? What do they already know? Who is the poem written to? As your narrative competence grows, it increases your ability to navigate the ambiguity of images and metaphors. People and situations come with ambiguity and complexity that can only be represented at times with images and metaphors. Metaphors defamiliarize the actual, making of it a mirror by virtue of placing things side by side that do not seem to belong together. Think about that in when we looked at the great empty cup of attention. That's, that's a metaphor. It puts attention and an empty cup side by side. And that allows us to see attention in a new way. And then narrative competence allows us to discern time. Um, here I have discerned two sorts of time. Time can be a discrete succession, a series of events, um, or it can be an integration or culmination and closure, a type of aha moment, a configuration. And that discrete succession is this chronological listing of events. Um, there's a story that leads to one thing that leads to another, but the configuration is what it all means. So, so let me just give a really brief example of this. So uh, a series of incidents or chronological time. I got my keys, I started the car, I went to the grocery store, and when I arrived, I bought two plums. That's just a series of events that I've told you. Configuration. When I left the store, I saw a man with tattered shoes sitting on a bench. I sat beside him. We ate the two plums. You can see that the events then begin to take on meaning. Narrative competence trains us to hear others. Close reading is not just a way 
of reading, but a way of listening. It gets at the idea of that empty cup of attention and close reading can train us to hear other people, can also restore a sense of self. I love this quote by Arthur Frank. Stories can repair the damage that illness has done to the ill person's sense of where she is in life and where she may be going. Stories are a way of redrawing maps and finding new destinations. So let's, let's practice. Let's do a little narrative medicine work together. We'll go to the next slide. I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna read this poem. Now there's been a lot happening in the chat, so I need to get caught up. Um, great. I'm going to read this, this poem, Lost by David Wagner. And as I'm reading it, make some notes to yourself. Uh, I invite you to, to think about what do you see? Whom do you hear? What are some of the images and metaphors? Uh, maybe what does the poem say about time? Make some notes and then um, I invite you to, uh, I think the chat is open now. I invite you to, to post in the chat. What are your observations? What are you seeing? Let me go ahead and read. Lost by David Wagner. Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here and you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest reads, listen. It answers, I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. And a few of you go ahead and type um, into the chat. What, what are you seeing here? Uh, what are you feeling? Any metaphors, any images stand out? Someone says, reminds me of moments uh, I've been in nature and immediately evokes a sense of peace and comfort. Thank you. Stay calm and life will meet you where you need help. Someone else, I've been lost in a forest for a short while. It was a very scary experience until I got my bearings and found the way back to my campsite. There's a little story in that, isn't there? And some of these images and metaphor, the forest breathing. Someone else says cancer treatment is a powerful stranger. Do you see now how we're, we're adding to this? We're, we're relating to, to life through what we're reading here. Cancer treatment is a powerful stranger to the families and children I work with, yet they must learn to be present in the unknown. Being present in the unknown. That, that's an observation from this piece. Thank you for those of you who, uh, who participated. Now let's go to the next slide. And you, this is, so that is a, that's close reading. And uh, we would do that in the narrative medicine workshop. So uh, the discussion would go on for much longer. Um, let's go to the next slide. Now here's where we're going to write. Um, I won't ask anyone in the interest of time, I won't ask you to share um, what you've written. 
but take, I'm gonna give us just two minutes and write about what comes in the stillness, write what comes, first comes to mind, just right beneath the surface. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be a poem. Don't worry about anything correct. Just write for two minutes, starting now. Write about what comes in the stillness. All right, finish up the last sentence that you're on. All right, let's come back together. So what you've written is what narrative medicine calls representation. You have crafted a representation of the inside of you. When you offer a question like this to a patient or a family, you directly enhance opportunities to hear their voices on their terms. So let's shift uh, a little bit to another use of uh, narrative medicine and clinical practice. And uh, let's talk about uh, its narrative medicine techniques that I've used in workshops uh, with patients, families, um, and providers. Um, these are two texts uh, that were used in uh, workshops with families who have lost a child to cancer. Uh, the text on the left, you can see, is a photograph and highlights of the workshop that we did with this photograph include the candid way participants describe the contrast they witnessed in the photograph. The photograph is called After the Storm. They talked about how those contrasts related to grief and trauma. And when asked what they saw in the photo, participants described an ominous scene in terms like, I see a storm approaching or danger or out of control and so much uncertainty. In contrast though, there were other participants who described more hopeful features they saw and felt. During the discussion, one particular moment stood out. A parent who remained constrained and had shared very little said, I see darkness, but the wind is calm. I feel that it's safe to come out. We can breathe and relax from the tension. With her words, the rest of the group came to attention and we were all silent for a moment. They felt her relief, which gave them all permission to feel their own relief. And then the second text that was shared uh, was uh, Hope is the Thing with Feathers uh, by Emily Dickinson. It's a very familiar poem, you may know it. And instead of mediating a discussion surrounding hope, Emily Dickinson's poem in this particular group seemed to irritate uh, the parents. One kept repeating, I'm really struggling with this poem and I don't get it. We asked what others saw in this text and parents described the poem as packed with contradictions. 
And then I think this is really important. They said, there are no words to explain how we feel. Isn't that an important moment? There are no words to explain how we feel. Despite the struggle, struggle to find comfort with the text and something beyond this text, uh, you know, there was, there was, the families talked about the chaos in their own narratives. They did move past the words though, to craft their own complex narrative of hope. And this next slide will demonstrate that. Um, so we had a writing prompt uh, for the picture of the tree and the storm clouds coming right about a time after the storm. There was such relief after the storm, we survived. We came through it intact. There was a calmness and a sense of joy. We had hoped tomorrow would be better. We felt stronger after coming through the danger and severity of the storm. We had an experience that we would never forget. It made us realize the unpredictability of nature and how vulnerable we all are. We do not have the control we once thought we had. And then in response to the Emily Dickinson poem, write about a place where hope lives. Hope lives in every moment of every day. It is the wish that I can truly live a life that honors you while moving forward in positivity. It is remembering without dwelling. It is doing good in the hope that it makes a difference. It is that place deep in my heart where I yearn that no one else ever has to feel the pain of this loss and that I can make a difference for those who do. Can you see how using these, these objects, these texts enabled a discussion, enabled the families to navigate some of their journey uh, in a very different way. Some of the parents told us it was a wonderful way to process um, their journey uh, externally um, instead of always looking inside. And narrative medicine uses um, uh, 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 some words. They talk about the third object in the room. Isn't that interesting? The third object in the room that we're looking at and learning from and internalizing. All right, uh, let us go to the next slide. So attending to self in the presence of colleagues. Uh, this is a different workshop that I conducted uh, that I led with healthcare providers. Uh, two participants read aloud the short story Bird by Catherine Bush. The story recounts a man's struggle to save a wounded bird that ultimately dies under his care. Participants described multiple themes in the text like life and death, choices we make, the what ifs, and the preciousness of impermanence. A participant said that the bird dying reminded him of the patients he had lost. He described the patient's family as always waiting for the other shoe to drop and being afraid to hope. He might just have well been describing himself. I returned participants' attention to the text of the short story, which concludes, the man laid his head on the steering wheel and wept. His heart crashed about inside his chest. He wept for all the chance encounters that had not ended as he had hoped. He wept for the missing who hover out of reach and tantalize us with the possibility that at any moment our lives might turn out to be entirely different. The workshop seemed to create a new avenue of conversation with providers, resulting in a kind of deep sharing that was previously not occurring. All right, let's take a look at a painting. We've looked at a poem, now let's look at a painting. Take a, take a minute and, and look at this. There is a lot going on here. What are your observations? Where do you think we are?
what is happening in the background? What, what's happening in the earth? Do you find yourself anywhere in this painting? And what about the woman in the center? What is her story? What story is she trying to tell? So let's do what we did the last time. Please go ahead and, and write your observations uh, of this painting. How is it making you feel? What are you seeing? What do you imagine the woman's story to be? Someone says they feel a lot of heartbreak in this image, uh, watching our planet uh, slowly die. Does anyone feel something different uh, as they're looking at this painting? Someone's talking about the woman. She has lived through many changes in her country and has survived. She is a survivor. Um, someone else, it's the positive and, and negatives of how the lady is seeing the world through her eyes and her mind. That's an interesting perspective. Can you see how we just shifted? We're, we're on the outside looking at the painting and that comment just gave us a chance to say, oh, wait a second, let's see this through the woman's eyes. Someone else says, I sense a woman's powerful defiance and fighting spirit. Great, thank you all for your engagement. Um, that's again, just an exercise in close reading that would go on a bit longer if we were in a narrative medicine workshop. Um, let's go to our next slide, and you can see this is a self-portrait called On the Border. It's self-portrait on the border, borderline between Mexico and the United States, painted in 1932 by Frida Kahlo. And let's go on to the next slide. So I am keeping an eye on the clock, and we've got just a couple more things that I want to cover. Um, and I'd like to have just a few minutes to open it up for questions. Uh, so we're not gonna write right now, but I invite you, write this down, wherever you've been taking your notes, write about inhabiting two worlds and time yourself. Three, maybe four minutes, five at the most. Uh, do that later today while you have that image uh, in your mind. And let's go on to the next slide. So our final objective and uh, the final application of narrative medicine um, that I think is, is really important is applying it to um, issues of disparity. So how do we do that? Um, I wanna talk about one example. Um, it's addressing issues of disparity in healthcare access um, or resources that do affect disease progression and outcome. And this is one example, there are many others. Medical anthropologist, uh, Cheryl Mattingly, and I think we're gonna post this article. Uh, oh, thank you, it just got posted. Um, medical anthropologist, Cheryl Mattingly tells the story of an African-American mother named Barbara, whose daughter became progressively ill with headaches and vomiting. Barbara and her daughter were sent home again and again after long waits at the emergency room. And during the last 
of these encounters, Barbara begged the provider again for help. The provider said, I don't see anything. Uh, social work was sent into the room and Barbara asked if they called the social worker on all people. Um, she then picked up her daughter and marched through the halls declaring that her baby was sick and she wasn't leaving until somebody saw her. The child was seen by another provider and finally diagnosed with a brain tumor. And this is really important. Mattingly writes in clinical encounters that cross race and class lines Worries over being misread constitute major threats. In Barbara's story, the doctor's fear of Barbara plays a part in preventing her from listening in detail to Barbara's description of her worsening symptoms. However, if we're paying attention, cultures provide resources for sense-making, because they allow the invention of plausible narrative scenarios. Let me say that again. Cultures provide resources for sense-making because they allow the invention of plausible narrative scenarios. They help place actions within possible histories. Here's where we're emptying ourselves and coming to attention. We're listening for a story. We're imagining what's going on. If we don't do that, we're missing out on opportunities to see everything that is in front of us. To imagine the story that the other person is in. Narrative medicine invites us to be fully present in these moments in encounters, to attend fully to the other, to recognize the story that we are in despite its ambiguities or its chaos. And think back just a moment ago to the Rita, um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm getting the name completely wrong, Frida. You can see how I made that mistake, the Frida, the Frida Kahlo uh, painting. Uh, oh my goodness. What story was happening there? There were a lot of ambiguities. There was some chaos, but, but someone was starting to craft a story for this woman uh, and, and to see her as more than the illness, the body. And so um, I'm, going to, I'm going to wrap up um, with a poem. And this is an additional part of narrative medicine workshops. We've done, um, we've done some of this type of writing at Cancer Support Community. I've done it with uh, providers as well. Um, and I want you to, to, to pay close attention. Attention, representation, and affiliation are coming together in this poem. Uh, so earlier this year, during a workshop that I conducted with providers, I led participants in, uh, this is separate from the writing prompt that we did earlier. This is a separate prompted writing exercise instructing them to write just one sentence in response to a prompt. Uh, and they, they wrote it on cards. Uh, if you're doing it on Zoom, you can do it in the chat. But the prompt was the strength of our team. And following a brief time of writing, facilitators collected the anonymous responses and then crafted uh, the, the, the words into a single community poem, which you see in front of you, called One Encounter. And, and I'll end with this. And uh, Myra, um, maybe we can take a few questions or, or comments if there are any. The, Wonderful. Str the strength of our team lies within the people broken human we care the faithful prosody back and forth one encounter at a time from this way and that until we have eyes to see the patient clearly our shared love and care of our patients and their families we see you our patients one encounter at a time 
the strength of our team and surprises, heals, blesses, teaches me every day. I am so grateful. We see each other one encounter at a time, seeing, hearing, listening, and respecting each individual team member. Diverse backgrounds, personalities, experiences we bring to the workroom, our shared goal until we have eyes to see the strength of our team lies with the people, our patients, their families, our team, the world, a better place, one encounter at a time. And then we can go to the next slide. Those are, I wanna show you, I do have references. And then we have a, a question slide. Um, so thank you everyone. And thank you for um, your engagement uh, in the session. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that amazing presentation. Uh, I will admit that narrative medicine is actually new to me as well. Uh, so, you know, I was very fascinated by everything that you were talking about and, you know, using some of that imagery and some of those poems, you know, it was actually a little kind of relaxing for me too, um, you know, and so I really enjoyed it. Now I'm going to start off with the, a few questions did come in. I'm going to use one of mine first, uh, one of the privileges of hosting, right? Um, in, in your experience, what are some of the common challenges or barriers that healthcare institutions face when implementing narrative medicine practices and how can some of those challenges be overcome? Yeah, that's such a great question. I think that the one of the biggest challenges that I've seen in my experience is time. Where do you find the time uh, to get the team together uh, you know, for an hour and focus on something completely different? Um, that's, that's been a barrier, uh, teams that I've worked with have, some of them have had, uh, regular times outside of team meetings. One team had, uh, once a month, uh, they called it a tea time on Fridays. And so we scheduled the narrative medicine workshops for that time. I, I also think another challenge is understanding um, the value of narrative medicine practice and um, really finding a champion on a particular healthcare team that uh, understands the practice, sees its application to, um, to communication on a team, uh, to, to self. You know, if, if we're communicating as a team in better ways, um, it's going to help our patients and families. Um, you know, I think narrative medicines uh, was initially created uh, to help providers see their patients and families. And, and I think, yes, that is occurring. But I think uh, care of self, team distress, team communication are also benefits. Thank you so much for that response. And we did have a few questions come in. The first one saying that from a practical standpoint, how can healthcare practitioners and providers integrate narrative medicine into their work with patients? And what would you recommend they do as a first step? Mm, that's, you guys have such great questions. I, you know, I would say as a first step, if you're a novice um, in narrative medicine is spend more time with it. Um, so that uh, you can uh, learn uh, more about it. Um, Columbia, uh, the Columbia Narrative Medicine Program in New York, and I believe this is, uh, I, we just posted narrative medicine resources, and I believe what I'm about to tell you is in that PDF, so download that. But the uh, Narrative Medicine Program at Columbia hosts virtual narrative medicine workshops on Zoom twice a week. So join some of those, immerse yourself, learn more. Um, and there are some resources on that page for you to read. And then beginning to use it in your practice. 
maybe try a bit of what we did today. Maybe if you've had a hard day, um, go home and write for three minutes about that patient family. Just write it out. Um, maybe when you go back the next day, uh, you'd share that with them or not. Uh, maybe you'll see them uh, in new ways, understand them differently, understand yourself and your relationship to them differently. And then I think a third thing um, is um, offering narrative medicine workshops to families. And again, the challenge is time and place. Um, but if, if your team is in uh, the, the practice of offering uh, some kind of uh, group support to families, I think that is a uh, hosting narrative medicine workshops with families is, is a wonderful practice. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, because another question came in about how can providers make the time. So thank you for addressing that because that is hard to find. Now, somebody else asked, how can they get the book on principles and practice of narrative medicine? Uh, that book is in the narrative medicine resource document. Um, so if you uh, if you can download that, if you um, if you can't, um, you can reach um out to us. Um, I'm just going to give the info email info at cancer support la.org and we will send it to you. But that should have the book, um, that should have the virtual sessions at Columbia. There are also a couple of talks that Rita Sharon has given um, that are in that document. And then the quote that I read from Arthur Frank about what stories of illness can do. And it talked about redrawing maps. Arthur Frank's book is called The Wounded Storyteller. Um, and it is, um, it's one of the foundational books in narrative medicine as well. Thank you. Another question came in asking, how does narrative medicine help the family or friends to manage a, the grief of after a person has died? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, and I think each person has to go through their grief in their own way. And so there's not really one answer, but I, I think it can help. I can't take it away but I think it can help by providing a space to talk about grief in a, in a new way. Um, one of our bereaved parents who took one of uh, the workshops said um, that very thing, that it helped her to process her grief journey in a new way. And it was wonderful to process it externally by looking at a painting, by reading the poem, and then writing about it. And, 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 and narrative medicine purposefully has those timed responses uh, because it's, it's, it is getting at what is just beneath the surface. And sometimes in the grief journey, what is, is just beneath the surface is, stays there until we give it form and, and write it out. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I think that it helps provide another avenue for conversations about it, I think is, is the way that I would put that. Wonderful, yeah, an outlet, right, that we often all need. Now, um, this is gonna be our last question, but uh, somebody asked, how do you use narrative medicine if you have a disability and cannot put pen to paper? Mm, that is, a most excellent question. <laughs> um, you know, I think that you, um, I think you find other ways to communicate. Um, you know, how, however you are uh, communicating and engaging uh, with the world in those ways, um, you can do that through narrative medicine as well, whether that is, you know, dictating um, to someone else, dictating to um, a computer, but uh, 
you know, finding a way um, to express your thoughts. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I think uh, narrative medicine was a new uh, model for a lot of us. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to share that expertise. Uh, I, I didn't even know, like you said, that there was a master's of science in narrative medicine. It's fascinating. And, you know, other folks might be interested in pursuing that career as well. So we're going to uh, take a short break right now. And our next presentation is going to begin at 1045 a.m. And it's going to uh, feature Dr. Laura Baba. See you all at 1030. At 1045, sorry. <laughs> 